All right, first of all, um, let me say that um, next week, uh, we're gonna do chapter two. So if you could read chapter two next week, we'll do the same thing next week on Friday. Okay. Sir. We'll go over chapter chapter two, sort of line by line, or really, I guess, what I'm more interested in than anything is not all, not everything in the chapter is important, but so I'm going to kind of hit the important okay. important parts. Um, question. Now, oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, like coming up, will we have like a essay or we have some stuff like that coming up? Correct. Um, yeah. Uh, there mm -hmm. are there are three main things that you have to worry about, and only three. Okay. You got a, in another week or two, maybe three, there will be the first exam. And there will be like a midterm exam and then a final exam. And that's so that's okay. the big thing. Okay. Are those going to be now, multiple people, choice? No, that will be essay. Oh, okay. And the reason it's going to be essay is I, I find that people can tell me more in an essay about what they know. And people prefer, mm -hmm. I, people prefer essays, I think, because multiple choice, first of all, it doesn't really test what you know. Yeah. And secondly, more importantly, it doesn't let you tell me what you know. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the reason it's all, my, I, I used to try multiple choice and true and false and short mm -hmm. answer and all of that kind of stuff. And it just, people just did not, do as well okay so there'll be like uh, a few questions and we'll be expected to write like a few paragraphs uh concerning each question right okay i'll okay. usually tell you uh a suggested um uh, like 12 font half page or whatever okay, okay. a suggested length you, you won't have to do that you can write more if you want to mm -hmm. if you can say it in half the space that I ask you to say it in, you get extra credit. <laughs> okay, so, sounds good. So a, lot of that, a lot of that's up to you. And now I don't want anyone to obsess about these exams because um, people do much, much better on these things than they think they're gonna do. So don't, I don't want people worrying about test. I don't want test anxiety. <laughs> Um, I want I want you to loosen up, have some fun, not take yourself so seriously, mm -hmm. and certainly not obsess about this. Yeah. So we, we're here. We're here. I'm not here to get you. I know a lot of professors whose end in life is to try to pull something over on their students. Mm -hmm. I'm not one of those people. I'm straight up, straightforward. I won't lie to you or mislead you or try to trick you. I mean, sometimes, sometimes I don't know I'm doing that. It would, it would be, but it would be a mistake on my part if I mm -hmm. did that. So first of all, don't worry. Now, let me say to all of you folks and to those who will watch this later, mm -hmm. I get so many questions about, do I have to do the questions at the end of the chapter? And the answer is not unless I tell you to. Okay. Now, there, are, there are two reasons for that. The main reason and the most important reason is that those questions are set up for huge mega farm universities with classes with 150, 200 people in them taught by a grading assistant to a professor, then professor may show up once or twice a year, a semester and that's it. Most of the teaching is done by um, a grading assistant that's little if any older than the people who are taking the course in age. Uh, so it's set up for maximum numbers and simplicity and grading, and we're not into that. You're going to know a whole lot more, my, my hope is, <laughs> that you're going to know a whole lot more than those questions will ever be able to elicit. Uh, frankly, 
they are simply too simple. Um, you're, you're going to, your knowledge of uh, philosophy and ethics is going to be much deeper than they will ever be able to touch. So that's the reason I don't fool with them. Uh, you know, I've, I've done this for pretty close to 40 years now. So I, I, I'm not a trainee. Um, so I hope to impart a depth of knowledge in the, um, uh, in the course that you simply would not get at the University of Texas. I'm not, pulling, I'm not picking on any particular university system, but the huge, large mega systems. So you get much more personal attention by the professor, hopefully with me, at least that's the way I try to do it. So that's the reason guys do not, and I repeat, do not sweat those end of chapter questions, unless you want to do them as just practice or whatever, but that would be simply on you. It's not required for me. Now, if I do want you to do that, I will send you out an advance notice week or two beforehand saying, please do the end of chapter review questions. I've never done that before. I'm not saying I would not do that. Um, more than likely, you will never have to worry about that. But if I want you to, I will ask you to. All of my assignments will be on Blackboard and or WebAdvisor. If it's not on one of those two venues, it does not exist and there's no need for you to worry about it. Uh, that being the case, there's going to be a couple of assignments coming out on Blackboard. Uh, a reminder about the divided line essay that you need to read by March. Um, then a reminder about the second chapter for next week. Um, I think that's going to be it as far as, um, as things coming up that you need to pay attention to. All right, now let's, um, let's delve into chapter one of Poeman. And I'm going to bring up a screen here. I'm going to uh, be using the physical textbook. Uh, and the reason I do that is it's simply much easier for me to get around in the textbook and show things to you than it is to try to bring up the uh, e-text on the screen and flip through it. So this is a, the same text that's in on the e-text exactly, except this is a physical text. And uh, the, the, uh, the e-text is not numbered by pages. So, uh, you pay basically, as you are reviewing what I say here, using the physical text, you need to watch the uh, headings and subheadings. Because those are the same in the e-text and the physical text. Okay, so we're gonna turn to chapter one. One of the uh, first things that he turns to, you guys are far too um, young to remember this, uh, but I do as a child. Uh, I was probably too young to remember the date the actual thing happened, but um, I do remember people talking about it. It was, uh, it was huge in the media at the time. Kitty Genovese, a young woman returned um, late one night to her apartment and was uh, brutally attacked and murdered. And many, many people watched the crime going down and nobody called the police. This is the way that Poyman introduces the need for an ethical system. I would 
I would go back further than he does. I the Greek uh, the Greek world. As a matter of fact, I guess you might uh, you might even say that the Bible of the ancient world was the um, the work uh, Iliad and uh, Odyssey. Everybody, uh, Alexander the Great had a copy of the Iliad that he um, carried with him wherever he went. Um, in ways that people today carry uh, their Bibles or their Torahs or um, their worship books with them as they uh, travel. So it was it was the huge meditational source of the day. And it's, uh, of course, about the uh, Trojan War. And there's a whole lot of killing uh, going on in the Iliad. And it looks simply on the surface uh, like it's just a book about war. There's another great, uh, the Bhagavad Gita in um, Indian society is, is a similar uh, epic uh, poet poem and, and has the same sort of profound influence on um, Indian thought that uh, the Iliad does on Greek thought. And, and I'm referring to the Iliad because it is a focal point for why we should be ethical. The Greeks meditated on this and formed their ethics, I think basically uh, on the, the, uh, the root system of this ancient uh, epic poem, the, the Iliad, just as, um, as Poyman is basing his question of why be ethical on this uh, poignant and, uh, and, and sad story of uh, a young woman who dies and no one seems to uh, care. Um, let, me, let me just go over the Iliad for a moment because it's, uh, you know, I, I want you to know that this is more than simply a, um, a war poem, although it is a poem about warriors and about courage and about all of those virtues, justice, prudence, moderation, and courage that we've talked about as being foundational for Greek uh, thinking and for ethics uh, in general. Um, Achilles, of course, is uh, sort of the hero of uh, the Iliad and uh, his, uh, his friend um, is killed, dressed up as Achilles and um, uh, Priam, the king's son, uh, kills uh, Achilles' uh, friend um, and everybody thinks that he's killed Achilles, but he's actually uh, murdered, killed in battle. I guess you could say murdered, but he at least killed uh, Achilles' best friend. Well, Achilles goes on a rampage and he just basically annihilates um, everything in his path. It's just a murderous uh, assault. And um, he will not let the body of um, Hector, the man that he has killed uh, masquerading as himself. Um, he would not al allow Priam, uh, the king, to, um, to bury his son, which is in Greek uh, society is simply the major duty of a relative. Uh, Antigone, uh, uh, a play, is also about this. Antigone uh, wants to bury her brother and the king refuses to let her uh, bury her brother. And she does it anyway and is executed because uh, she does the right thing by doing what uh, Greek uh, religion required her to do. So she's found to be an enemy of the state by doing what is right. But King uh, Priam, um, his major duty is to, the only thing he wants to do, he's an old man, so he wants to, to bury his son. So he uh, slips into a wagon and um, is secreted into um, Achilles' camp and actually slips into uh, Achilles' tent and, um, and begs Achilles for the body of his uh, his son. 
And of course, Kelly's is, he's just, he's astounded at this because he says, don't you realize that I could kill you 50 times over? And he's, he's, he's brought up short by the courage of this man. And, and the old king could have actually have killed him in his sleep, but he doesn't. And so the, the scene is extremely poignant with the old king, the, the, the old, old man uh, kissing the hand of the warrior, uh, asking uh, that the hand of the warrior that killed his son, asking for the body, simply the body of his son, nothing more than just to do the right thing. The Greeks were absolutely astounded and fixed by um, this simple act of humility. And, and uh, Achilles is too. Now Achilles is raged at the death of his, at the death of his best friend. He's murdered and pillaged and uh, done everything that blood would allow him to do. And he's still so wrought with anger and um, anxiety and hatred. He can get no peace. And suddenly uh, he has peace. Not only does he give Priam the body of his uh, son, but a truce is declared for at least uh, a few days. And the irony, and Greeks are always into irony, but the irony of this is that sometimes, well, it, well, the Iliad's about the tragedy of war and how war really never brings peace to anything. What brings peace is the courage of an old man and the respect of a warrior that lets go of war in order to do the right thing. So the Iliad's about the tragedy of war, but more important, it's about simple acts of right in the midst of wrong. Um, and so the Iliad basically says that peace is understanding the tragedy of what we are capable of doing to each other. So I would submit to you that ethics is peace to some degree. It's understanding the tragedy of what we are capable of doing to each other and seeking a higher ground. So that would be my um, choice of um, examples to talk about why be ethical. I would go all the way back to the Greeks. Of course, you might know that from listening to some of my blather uh, already. All right, we, we turn over here to ethics and its subdivisions. Um, Now he divides these into descriptive morality, moral philosophy, which is also called ethical theory and applied ethics. I, I disagree um, and I may ask you um, how you appreciate that disagreement. But I would, what he calls descriptive morality is to me, nothing more than what the sociology department does. It's, it's how describing how people uh, choose to um, organize their lives. That is to me is not a prerogative of philosophy. That's simply a, a prerogative of a social science a description of how people live their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, so here's how I would characterize this. And let me get to the bottom down here and you see where I've written in here. Uh, so I would say number one, ethics or moral theory 
um, ethical theory, moral theory. By the way, when I, I use the word moral theory interchangeably with ethics sometimes because that's simply what ethics is. I, I think I explained the word ethic comes from the Greek word ethnic, or um, which means the way different people do things. Um, we're not interested in the way people do things. We are interested in what acts are right. And that's a bigger question than the sociological question of how people organize their lives. Because even amongst the way many people organize their lives or countries organize their lives, uh, there is something bigger than that. We, we, were, we got into this debate recently when President Biden uh, said something to the effect that um, uh, Chinese um, leaders uh, organized their lives uh, differently. He was talking about the, uh, at least the alleged um, mistreatment of a Muslim um, countrymen by uh, the Chinese. Uh, and many people, I, I don't know, I don't know the president's heart. I don't mean to say that I do. I hope he didn't mean it that way, but many people took this to mean that the Chinese could basically do what they wanted to do because they made their own uh, decisions. I, I hope he's not that um, that um, level of a moral relativist, but I, I don't know. Uh, that, that's one of the big questions, of course, that we're facing. So, so no, number one part of ethics then is moral theory. The second is uh, meta ethics. Now, um, by meta ethics, meta is a Greek um, um, a Greek word for after. I, I, I mentioned in my lecture on Aristotle, I think, that the um, ontology, his, his attempted answer to what does it mean to be, ontos be, uh, is called metaphysics simply because he discusses these sort of last things after the book on physics, hence the name metaphysics. The book after the physics is, uh, deals with ontology. So meta means after. It's, and we sometimes in the literature now refer to this as meta-analysis, which you should understand as kind of the analysis of the analysis. And of course, that's what philosophy does. That's the great thing that philosophy does. It's also the weakness of what philosophy does because we simply analyze and analyze and analyze. Now, at some point we have to act and any good ethical theory will draw an end at some point to the analysis and seek an application. So I say that there are three parts of ethics, moral theory, meta-ethics, and applied ethics. Now that's different than the three things that, um, that Dr. Poyman lists here. So I'm gonna ask, I might ask you to think about that on a question, whether the, where, uh, which of those two um, descriptions of what ethics does to you appreciate. All right, moving on to the next page. Uh, I want you to see here, the study of ethics is not only of instrumental value, in other terms, uh, how uh, things are applied uh, how is ethics instrumental to getting something done? But it's also valuable in its own right. Now, the word there that we would use is intrinsic. Intrinsic. It has intrinsic value. It's valuable for in and of itself. Um, so, so ethics is valuable for what it can allow us to do, what it recommends that we can do. Uh, and it's also valuable in and of itself. In other words, it is a, a, a 
Uh, it is a topic worthy of study. Now, uh, I want you to, and, and we'll go on here, I say see page six here, we'll talk about what that refers to in just a moment. moment. But an ethical theory is like any other theory. Science has theories, philosophy has theories. Now the truth of a theory is in its applicability and its repeatability. So no matter how nice a theory seems or sounds, what is it that it does? Now in, in science sometimes, we may, see, we may say, well, we don't want to let people know this because it might scare them. Yeah, you know, I don't know. Let's suppose that this is just a supposition because uh, scientifically, uh, we must assume that extraterrestrials don't exist. We simply don't publicly have one. Same with Bigfoot. Um, although people may see them, that's not doesn't satisfy scientific evidence. But let's suppose that there is a scientist someplace that knows this and uh, he or she may say to uh, her colleagues, uh, well, we, you know, we don't, let, we don't let this get out because it might scare people. So a theory, a, a hypothesis may be kept secret simply because it, might do more harm than good, at least in the perception of the individual scientist. And that's where the problem is, you see, because that's just one person's uh, opinion or even a group of people's opinion. And the fact that one person holds it or 50 people hold it doesn't make it necessarily right. And in ethics, we have, we have a stronger sense of truth because that truth must be public. There is not, and I, let me repeat this, there is not a secret in ethics. No ethical theory can be held in secret. If it is, it is ipso facto not a theory, an ethical theory. So one of the criteria that an ethical, that a true ethics must have is publicity. And we're gonna see later on, on what I say, page six, uh, I'll make sure that's connected to you. Uh, you understand that in your e-text. But one of the main things of ethics is its publicity. It must be public. You must be able to spread it abroad. And more than that, not just able to spread it abroad, but have broad understanding of that ethical principle. It's called uh, overridingness. And it's not just a feel good theory. It must be overriding. People must say, hey, that's a good idea. Um, and in medical ethics, uh, which is important, always has been, but it's certainly important these days, this goes into the idea of informed consent. If you do an experiment on an individual, that person needs to understand the good, the bad, and the ugly of what might happen to them. Uh, in the UK, uh, recently there have been young people, principally, I think everyone is under 30, but they've been injected with uh, COVID-19, the new strains of COVID-19 to see the response of these young people. In, in many ways, that's disgusting. I mean, as I'm a medical uh, ethics consultant, I do consulting work in medical ethics. If, if that case, the possibility of doing that experiment was presented to me, man, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure that I could um, participate in that or even give credence to the question of whether you would, even informing someone, inject them with a potentially deadly disease. Uh, recently, uh, I was involved in a consulting um, 
a case in a fairly large Midwestern uh, uh, office practice. Uh, two of the founding uh, doctors in this practice were retiring. And they were uh, hiring two or three uh, younger uh, physicians to uh, take their place. They asked me to um, give them advice about whether they should use this opportunity to get rid of what they considered problem patients. Uh, by that, I, I think they meant patients that um, uh, maybe didn't pay or uh, were just grouches or never you know, appreciated anything that they did for them. Um, they were really confusing etiquette and ethics, which we'll talk about in just a minute, uh, things that people confuse with ethics. What they wanted me to do was to tell them, yeah, this is okay, and this is how you, um, this is what you say in the letter where you uh, fire these uh, patients, basically. Uh, this is what you say in the letter so that number one, you don't get into legal trouble. And number two, you don't get on the media for uh, bouncing granny from uh, her uh, doctor so that you uh, continue to look good. So they weren't really, I mean, the doctors that formed this firm were not really interested in ethics. They were simply interested in covering their behinds. Um, they were interested in how ethically uh, people would consider this so that they wouldn't get into any kind of legal or um, trouble in the, um, in, in the neighborhood. So they weren't really seeking a medical ethics uh, construct. They were simply uh, wanting an excuse to do what they would like to do to begin with is free themselves from these troublesome uh, people. Well, doctors don't do that. I mean, that's a violation of their foundation of medicine as it was um, uh, as it was conceived by the Greeks. Uh, so everybody understands what the uh, Hippocratic Oath is. Uh, there is absolutely it's that would be absolutely forbidden in the uh, in the Hippocratic Oath. The major duty of the doctor is to his or her patient, no matter what kind of curmudgeon that patient is. That's not the purpose of the doctor. The doctor does not decide the psychological or moral um, uh, category of uh, the patient. The doctor uh, heals. All right. So they, I ended up doing that work for free because they did not like um, my recommendations. Um, basically, my recommendations were don't do that. All right, so here are the things that confuse people. Um, religion, number one. Now there is an ethic in religion and we're gonna talk about that um, at some point more thoroughly. Um, there are, well, St. Thomas Aquinas is really the person that talks about this more than any other uh, philosopher. Um, he tells us that the person can, uh, a person can be moral. In other words, the Greeks were certainly not um, at least um, modern. They didn't uh, practice any kind of modern religion. They were pagans. Um, but the problem with that Greek philosophers uh, touch is that the, the questions about what I ought I to do that arose out of pagan religion were simply wrong. Um, so intel, for the Greeks, the, the major thinkers in Greece, what ought I to do was not a religious question because the religion was just plain um, out of bounds. All of you know um, the interactions of Zeus and Hera 
and the other major gods with people. These, these were not deities in terms of wise and profound thinking deities. Uh, these were you know, deities with human appetites, with, uh, with human drives, and um, um, they were not good people. So Greek philosophy sought uh, the explanation of what ought I to do outside of the bounds of, um, of religion. St. Thomas Aquinas being a Christian thing, a theologian as well as a philosopher says, well, you know, they were right about that. Uh, Greek philosophy can establish what ought I to do but it is a highly intellectual activity. Can all people have the brains, St. Thomas asks, to decide logically, metaphysically, ontologically, what ought I to do? And his answer was no, a common folk uh, can't do that. They don't have that level of education and training. It's possible. But the cobbler or the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the boatman doesn't have that time. He or she is so concerned with just survival that they don't have time for the greater concepts of thinking. But St. Thomas said, following the dictates at, at, of the Christian arrhythm, there's a high ethic. There's an ethic of love, which he says, even supersedes anything that the Greeks could have thought of by intellectual pursuit. So practicing biblical love, according to St. Thomas Aquinas, was a, at a higher level even than figuring all of this out intellectually. So the simple Christian person uh, could attain even a superior level of knowledge about what ought I to do than the highly intellectual person. And that's what we call a saints or example of this. Uh, there, most of the saints were common, everyday, simple farmers, simple people, and yet they're saints. And why is that? Well, because they listened to God, to scripture and attained that higher level through loving. I mean, really loving others, agape love. All, all of you know that there are, hopefully you know that there are three types of love in Greek. Agape, which means an in-depth, uh, ancient Greek used it as an intellectual love. Uh, Christian Greek writers used it as godly love. And then there's philos, where we get our word philosophy, love of wisdom, love of of wonderful, intrinsically good things. And then there's eros, where we get our word erotic, and I don't need to explain that to you, hopefully. Um, but there are three levels of love. All right, so religion is one of the ways that we can, can confuse what we ought to do. Uh, the, the second is uh, law, as you see here in this subheading. So then he goes into some detail here. Um, as you can see, you can match this with uh, your section in the same pages in e-text. So he goes into a discussion of law. Make sure that you understand that. That's important. Uh, law comes from ethics, is derived from ethics, but it is not ethics. Uh, sometimes, uh, ethically, we are duty-bound not to support law. I've talked about that before, uh, Dr. King's letter from the Birmingham jail. Uh, but, you know, I've told you, Dr. King is trained in St. Thomas Aquinas. So he knows St. Thomas's idea about how high an aspiration ethical behavior is. So he knows that that supersedes law. Sometimes we're called on to die rather than violate an ethical 
standard that the law tells us to do. A German law told its citizens to hate the Jews. Many Germans died rather than hating their brothers and sisters. So they answered a higher calling. So law is not the end all be all. Law hopefully comes from ethics, but we human beings miscalculate sometimes. So law is not the end. Ethical behavior is the end. All right, I mentioned uh, etiquette. Um, and I've talked about this before. Um, and we, we confuse etiquette, how we ought to behave sociologically, sociological rules and orders about how we relate to each other. We often confuse that with ethical rules and it's simply not. But again, like laws on a much lower level. Uh, hopefully, but not always, et etiquette rules derived from ethics, but not always. Most of the time, I'll take that back. Most of the time, it's simply local custom. And local custom can be unethical. And I've mentioned this at a much more mundane level before. Um, when I was uh, uh, elementary school, I think I told you this before, I stepped through the school door and the principal was there. And if you didn't take your ball cap off, whack, you got hit up behind the head, say, you know, take that thing off. Uh, I was a bad person. If I stepped across the school threshold with my cap on, I might be a bad person, but I wasn't a bad person because I wore my cap in the building. That's an example of ethics and mis, uh, of etiquette and misconstruing uh, ethical and etiquette rules. All right, that's basically what's there. Okay. Now, here we see traits of moral principles. Now, everybody, read my lips. There's a, this is probably the most often missed question in this course. And I don't know why. Um, I, 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 I'm guessing, I, I, this is just a guess. I, I know that when we, when I teach um, ethics to nurses, there is a thing in nursing called the traits of moral principles. Now that's different than Poyman. When I, when I ask you if, you, if you're in nursing or in medicine, and I ask you, what are the, the traits of moral principles? Don't give me that. You need to go back to the book here. These are the traits that I'm talking about. So everybody watch this. Don't, don't make this mistake. Um, the first is prescriptivity. Now by prescriptive, that's like a prescription, right? You go to the doctor, you got a headache. The doctor says, take this prescription. That is a prescription for the headache. So an ethical rule is a prescri prescription to remedy the wrong. All right. The second is universalizability. It, something that is truly ethical is not at a local time or a local place. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. If something is ethically true, it's across all time, all space, all countries. So when we say don't murder, we don't mean you can go down to Southeast Asia and it's okay to murder somebody, but up here in North America, it's not. If it's not okay to murder anybody, it's not okay in North America, it's not okay in South America, it's not okay in Asia, it's not okay in Europe. So it's universal. The prohibition against murder is not localized. This is simply um, uh, an ethical trait or a principle. You understand that, I hope, okay.
All right. The third thing is overridingness. This overrides everything. You can imagine this. If it's universal, if it's for all time and all place, then it would override local rules, right? So simply what we say here is that a moral theory overrides an etiquette principle. Um, the fourth we've talked about, I told you that we would come to in a minute, is publicity. It's got to be able to, you've got to be able to put this out. It should be easy to understand, easy to adopt. Everybody should agree with it. It, it should be that overarching. And the fifth is practicability. We might say practicality. Um, it's workable. It's, uh, it answers the question. And everybody sees that this is the best way uh, to do things. Okay. Again, here there are, he discusses um, acts. How do we act? Uh, the, the first act is an obligatory act. Morality requires you to do it. Uh, the second act is an optional act. It's, you, you don't have to do it or you don't have to not do it. Uh, it's not your duty to do it. Neither is it your duty not to do it. Um, and doing neither would make it wrong. So you either do it and you're okay, or you don't do it and you're okay. And then just simply a wrong act. Now, the, the bottom here, what's this word supererogatory? It's a highfalutin word. And, and he doesn't, he, he says this is beyond the call of duty. I, my major problem with the way Poyman reads this is that um, this, these acts are far more common than he gives uh, humans credit for, I think. Now, the, the primary example of a supererogatory act is um, in battle. Um, one of my favorite stories, and I forget which, um, which um, ocean isle it was in World, World War II, but um, the Marine Division was overrun and um, the enemy was literally chasing them from the beaches into the jungle. And they were, everybody was running for their life. And there was a young man, um, who was wounded and was slowing down his um, comrades who were trying to escape uh, the enemy. And so he told his, um, his brothers, uh, leave me here um, and you run, you save yourself, leave me here. Uh, and of course, everybody understood that the soldier, the Marine would die. And they said, no, we're not going to do it. Because if you've ever been in the Marine Corps, you know that you don't leave anybody behind. And you got to be big enough and bad enough to save yourself and save your brother or sister too. Uh, that's what a Marine does. A Marine just doesn't, not supposed to be interested in him or herself, interested in the platoon, the division, whatever. So they said, no, we're not going to do it. Uh, we're not going to leave you behind. He said, well, leave me, you're 45, and get out of here. Um, you know, I want you saved. I may die from my wounds anyway. So he finally persuades them to, to go on. When they returned for him the next day, and they found him, um, he was dead. But seven enemy soldiers 
or dead at his feet. So that's a supererogatory act. We find these mostly our heroes. We celebrate them because they do these things. Now that's not required. There was, you couldn't demand of anyone that they do this, yet the very basis of ethics itself, I would argue, is dependent upon this. Now, Dr. Poyman doesn't go into that much detail, and he doesn't go to that level, and I'm sorry, I think that if you understand what ethics really is, you have to go to that level. I think that's simply descriptive of what it is to be ethical. All right, we're going to go on in the text. Here we have a discussion of consequences uh, down at the bottom. The, the, the thing that I would um, ask you to think about here is uh, teleological ethics. Now, teleology is another one of those Greek words. I'm sorry, I have to keep laying those on you, but simply in this world, if you know anything, you got to know the Greeks first. Uh, uh, teleo is the Greek word for purpose. Uh, and of course, logical, you know that. There's a whole bunch of things that logos, logical, logoi, psychology, all of these things are the study of, right? So this is the study of purpose. Uh, what is the purpose in doing something? Um, the teleological ethics um, is um, probably the most, uh, the best known is the, the first sort of theory that we'll turn to after we discuss relativism. Um, the first real theory, the first big theory in ethics is consequentialism or utilitarianism. That's what's the purpose of an action. Those, those types of theories, uh, you, uh, um, utilitarianism, just what's the greatest, is the, the, pur the purpose of an act is the greatest good for the greatest number. That's what the purpose of an act is. So when we act, what act we choose should be the purpose of that act should be the greatest good for the greatest number. There are lots of problems with that. We'll talk about that later. Um, but that's a purpose of, you see, ethic, the greatest good for the greatest. That's the purpose of what we do, All right? That's what he means by teleological ethics. Then down here is character traits. Uh, read that, but you don't have to really uh, dive in deep on that. And then last, of course, is um, what I hear called motive. Um, According to uh, the second great, well, I think it's the greatest, but the second type of ethics that we will come into contact with is deontological ethics, which, by the way, is misnamed, and we'll we'll really dig into that when we come to it. But um, there's a famous statement by Immanuel Kant, which is the greatest spokesperson for what's called deontological ethics. Uh, there's nothing good but a good will. You can't be, your actions can't be measured by the outcomes because those are outside of your capabilities. Um, we, we see this in certain laws now called Good Samaritan laws um, where people cannot be blamed for consequences that they did not intend to happen. For instance, um, you know, if we were in class and we were going back home after class and I had an accident and you come across uh, my upturned car and I'm trapped in the car and the car is beginning to burn and I can't get out of my seatbelt because it's stretched and latched and I can't undo the latch. So you come along with your trusty knife 
and I'm upside down in my seat and the car's burning and you say, well, we got to get you out of here, come hell or high water, uh, because you're going to definitely die if you stay in here. So you cut my seatbelt and I fall down on the top of my upturned car and break my neck and die. Um, you can't be judged your, my death cannot be judged upon you because you intended to save my life by your actions. So what really is measured there and what ought I to do is the best that you can do with the best of your intentions and there's nothing else that can be measured. So that is simply, uh, the fact that I died is simply an accident not intended by your a goodwill uh, to save me. So uh, that's motive here. That's, uh, that's what he's talking about. All right. So here we see the conclusion and that's it. That is the, that's the end of the chapter. That's the end of chapter one. Okay. Here we go. Uh, any questions from this? All right. Well, everybody knows, not just the people who are on the video, but uh, people listening to the video too. If you need me for any reason or any concern, uh, then I'm just an email away and we can um, establish uh, one of these Zoom gizmos uh, together to answer any questions face-to-face, -face, virtually, uh, that you may have. So don't suffer alone. Okay. I appreciate No it. questions. We're not in. Oh, you bet. What? As I say, I appreciate it. That was a great lecture. Thank you. Good. Good. All right. Thanks, everybody. I'll Thank talk you. to you later. Bye. Bye.